Welcome. Welcome to the First Universalist Church of Rochester, where we are called to nurture the spirit and serve the community. Whoever you are, you are welcome here. Wherever you come from, you are welcome here. Whomever you love, you are welcome here. If you are struggling with what might have been yet never was, you are welcome here. It is good to be together this morning. We acknowledge with respect the Seneca Nation, keepers of the Western Door and part of the Haudenosaunee people on whose ancestral lands First Universalist now stands. Welcome to the First Universalist Church, where we are worshiping in a somewhat new way. We are a community of seekers both online and in person. And we are choosing to worship in person with masks on. We have both physically distant options for places where folks can sit, as well as options that allow for more closeness. This is a new arrangement, so please let everyone let us know what you think. If you are here for the very first time this morning, we especially welcome you. Thank you for making it to this worshiping community. We have a visitor's form that can be found in the chat for our folks who are online, and that can also be found in your pews for folks in person. So please fill out the form so that we can offer you a welcome beyond this worship service. Before we take a moment to turn to our neighbor, let us take a moment to turn towards the camera here, okay, and greet our online worshiping community. 
please offer a wave. If you are online, please pop into the chat to offer a greeting and to share your joys and sorrows. If you are here at First Universalist, let us take a moment now to turn to our neighbor this morning and offer a greeting. Please respect people's physical distance and obtain consent and ask before reaching out for a handshake or a hug. We encourage elbow bumps and placing a hand over each other's eyes. Let us greet one another. shall release its splendor that morning shall appear come in come into this place which we make holy by our presence come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths fears and anxieties loves, and hopes. For here you need not hide, nor pretend, nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place of justice in a week when you are grieving the loss of a fundamental right. Come into this place with your bruised spirit so that it can be nurtured and where you can gain the strength to fight anew. Come into this place where we can touch and be touched, heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come, come into this place. Together, we make it a holy place. Lassie Klein, oh yeah. Lassie Klein, come forward to light the chalice. As Marcy Klein lights our chalice at First Universalist Church, and as many of you light a chalice in your own homes, will you join me? in saying our chalice words in unison. May we be a people of welcome, here to grow in heart and mind and spirit, and may we reach out to serve our community.
Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our affirmation of faith followed by our doxology. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the source and meaning of life. Thus do we covenant with each other and with all. Each Sunday, we join each other with anticipation and joy, happy to see each other on the screen or in person, happy to participate in whatever activities are available to us in person or online. And yet, we do not forget our neighbors, our community, our church participates in many efforts to better the lives of Rochesterians. What we are able to do together is so much more than we could accomplish individually. And so each Sunday, in addition to our pledges, we give to our church to support its efforts in the community. Let us continue to be as generous as our circumstances permit. You are invited to drop an offering in the offering basket or to give online by scanning the QR code in your pew. For folks online, please click the link in the Zoom chat window to give to First Universalist Church. You can also send a check in the physical mail. Thank you for your generosity. You tender people, have sadness in your eyes. You've seen the fallen hopes, the chaos and the lies. Tell me, have we something to ease your pain? Why not give you happiness? And peace again. I know I've come before asking things for me, but you tender people need so much love you see tell me have we something to ease your pain why not give you happiness and peace again And comfort them 
just a friend of yours. I cannot move the stars. But you tender people read messages like us. Tell me, have we something to ease your pain? Why not give you happiness and peace again? Music. I invite you now into this reverent time of sharing the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. If you would like to, you can place a hand over your heart to be able to listen from a heart-centered place. As we place stones in the bowl, I will read aloud the joys and sorrows of our gathered community. All are also invited to share your joys and sorrows in the chat that we may hear from the community gathered here. And before I read what's in the book, a sorrow and a message from our UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. She writes, the Dobbs versus Jackson women's health decision does not alter Unitarian Universalist commitment to reproductive justice. This anti-choice decision by the Supreme Court infringes on our deeply held religious beliefs. Access to abortion and the right to choose is an issue of gender equality, bodily autonomy, and religious liberty, all of which, all of which, are long-held Unitarian Universalist religious teachings. The decision to limit this basic human right means that this fight will shift to state legislatures across the country. Guided by our moral values, we are prepared to be a part of that ongoing struggle and continue to show up for reproductive justice in all aspects of public life. You can find more of her statement online at UUA.org or on the First Universalist Facebook and Twitter pages. From Kitty, a joy, hearing Danielle ponder at parcel five last night is a pure joy. A joy from Dolores, my great niece graduated from high school. My great granddaughter was born June 16th. And a joy from Grant, action of Dick's Sporting Goods. As we drop one final stone into the bowl to represent all the joys and sorrows left in the unspoken and silent sanctuaries of our hearts, may all be held in the heart of love. Let us enter now into a time of meditation, contemplation, and prayer. Feel the earth beneath your feet as it supports you. Feel the love of this community as it surrounds and enfolds you. Feel your breath as it flows in and out of your body. Listen to your heartbeat. Listen 
to your heart. And how is it with your heart this morning? Does your heart feel whole, shielded by intellect, cocooned by reason, closed to feeling? Or is it broken, fragile to the touch, brimming with pain and loss? Is your faith in our fundamental American institutions shaken beyond anything you could have imagined possible this morning? Do you come here this morning with a fear of further erosion of fundamental rights? Has your heart been broken and healed so many times that it now lies open to the world, knowing that true growth comes not without pain, that tears may wear down barriers, that we may carry in our hearts and in the hearts of others pain which is too heavy for us to bear? None of us has an unblemished heart, not one. For such perfection can be found only in death, and we who are alive still have much to heal. So let us, let us honor the broken places in our hearts and in our lives. For it is only through such brokenness that we may truly touch one another, and only through touching one another that the world will be healed. Let us give thanks for the brokenness that we share. I believe that probably at many points over the years, I have mentioned that my sister was killed in a car accident when I was 12 years old. Her name was Janet, and she was 18 at the time. It was December 1974, two weeks before Christmas. Janet and her friends Sue and Cindy, also both 18, had gone to a rock concert to hear a local band. The concert was near Syracuse, about 25 miles away from home, and a bit out of my parents' comfort zone. But Janet persuaded them to let her go anyway. Now, Janet could be described as an artsy type person. Most people here are old enough to get the reference. She had a fashion sense a bit like Rhoda Morgenstern. 
and her passions were creative writing, drawing and painting, and music. She was also very intrigued by the fashion world, and she took classes at, remember, the Barbizon School of Modeling. Janet was definitely just biding her time before she could escape the dull, provincial, boring Auburn, New York for Manhattan. She had absolutely no interest at all in being a housewife, no desire to become a teacher or a nurse, as my parents suggested to her often. And absolutely, I'll just have to say this again, no desire to stay in Auburn. And she let my parents know this on a extremely regular basis, that in spite of what they thought was best for her, she definitely had other plans for her life. Now, a little time capsule here. I'm not sure how well people here remember the trends of 1974, but it was the era of glamour rock. Alice Cooper, David Bowie, and groupies. And Janet and her friends loved that whole scene. So they dressed up as groupies that evening. Janet wearing lots of glittery makeup, a, a big faux fur jacket, a feather boa, and six inch platforms. Remember the platforms of the 70s? And her friends were dressed up that way as well. And my very last memory of Janet was her showing off this outfit to us before Sue picked her up and all of the ooing and eyeing that the effect she had created in all of us. The next morning, about 5 a.m., I was woken up by somebody knocking on our front door. My bedroom was right at the top of the stairs and the front door was right at the bottom. So I heard it very clearly. My mother went down to answer the door. What I didn't know and couldn't have known was that my mother had been lying in bed worrying for several hours. Janet was supposed to be home by 2 a.m. at the very latest. Standing at the door, was my father's best friend and colleague. My father was a police officer and the sergeant on duty that night made sure that my father's friend was the one they sent to our door. So Janet had been killed in a car accident at just about 2 a.m., just about the time that she was supposed to be home. Sue, the driver of the car, was also killed and Janet's best friend, Cindy, was in the hospital with multiple injuries. They had been on their way home when they were hit by a drunk driver. He was driving down the wrong side of the road. He and his wife had been at a party all evening and they even had an open six pack of beer on the seat between them. From what we were told, they were both so inebriated that they did not even realize that they were in a car and they didn't grasp that there had been an accident. So according to witnesses, three or four cars swerved off the road to avoid them before they hit Sue's car head on. So the first question that came to everyone's mind was, if the other cars had seen the driver in time to avoid the crash, why hadn't Sue seen it? Everyone wondered this, but of course, no one will ever know. And that first, that first question, that first probing into the details was the start of months and months and months of constant questioning and speculating and probing by the entire family. Most futile and heart-wrenching of all were the never-ending and incredibly tantalizing if only questions. If only conversations. They went on and on and on. My parents and my grandparents would have if only conversations for hours and hours on end. If only we hadn't let her go, my parents said over and over and over and over. If only we had told her to be home earlier. If only, if only they had left a minute, even a minute earlier. 
if they had only left a minute later, if only, if only they had taken a different route, if only the concert had ended earlier, if only the concert had been on a different night. And on and on and on it went. There was no end to the infinitesimally small deviations in time or schedule or route or circumstance which would have averted the tragedy. But the speculation didn't stop there. Sue, the driver of the car, was a timid and unsure person but very sweet and very lovely. And her car was a tiny Volkswagen bug, a convertible nonetheless, a car which, by the way, was notoriously unsafe in crashes. Cindy, on the other hand, was a confident and very self-assured person and a much better driver, and her family had a full-sized Chevy. If only, if only Cindy had been driving, Undoubtedly, she would have been able to do what Sue had not been able to do, see the oncoming car in time to avoid the crash. And, and, even if she had not, her much sturdier car surely would have saved Janet. Yes, that was it, if only Cindy had been driving. And then there was the drunk driver himself to consider. If only he, if only he, had left his party a minute earlier or a minute later. If only he had taken a different route. If only someone at the party had realized just how inebriated he was and they had stopped him from driving. If only he had driven into a ditch instead of head on into a car full of 18 year old girls. If only he had hit a tree himself. If only, if only, if only. And on and on and on the if only speculation went. My grandparents took a slightly different tact. If only, they said over and over again to each other and to us, if only it had been one of us instead of her. We've lived full lives. We are ready to go. If only it had been one of us. And every single time one of these conversations took place, and they took place a lot, I felt worse and worse and worse because everyone was right. If only, if only one tiny thing had been different, my sister would still be here. If only the timing or the route or the vehicle or the driver or the car had been different, Janet wouldn't have died. Our family wouldn't have this huge hole suddenly open up where a lovely, kind, beautiful, and talented girl had been. Our house wouldn't feel like a funeral home all the time, and there wouldn't be a bedroom frozen in time, frozen in time right down to the teacup that Janet had been drinking out of that night when she was putting on all the glitter and all the makeup. It was still where she last said it. It sat there for two years. A room which became a time capsule of December 8th, 1974, per my father's orders. No one could enter and no one could disturb or touch anything. Even the teacup that continued to sit on the dressing table despite the mold which was now growing on the tea bag and in the bottom of the cup. Nothing could be touched. If only, if only, if only, if only, for a solid year at least, that was the mantra in our house. Even when no one was actively engaged in one of those if only conversations that I described, they still, in their minds, everyone, engaged in the possibilities of what could have played out that night instead of what actually did happen. It ran through our minds all the time. I know that it ran through my mind all of the time. I woke up thinking about it. I ended my day thinking about it some more. 
And right before falling asleep at night, I would replay the scenario over and over in my head and imagine all of the slight deviations that could have avoided what did happen. I never ever ran out of alternate scenarios, tiny changes in timing or route or circumstances, which had any one of them been just a fraction different, would have avoided the accident. And when the variations on the circumstances of the actual evening were exhausted, my parents expanded the if-only speculation beyond that specific evening to other events and circumstances, which would have put Janet any place else but in the westbound lane of Route 31 in the town of Elbridge at 2.15 a.m. on December 8, 1974. A few months earlier, Janet had met and become infatuated with an older man. He was 26 or so, I think, and she was only 18. So my parents put a very swift end to that. But now in hindsight, they regretted it. If only we hadn't put an end to that relationship, she would have been someplace safe with him that night, my mother decided one evening. And she spent the next week or so exploring variations on that theme. And then there was Janet's obsession with the glamour rock scene in the first place. Hadn't that been the real cause? My parents spent hours and hours kicking that one around. Wasn't that ridiculous obsession of hers, wasn't that the reason she was on that country road in the middle of the night in the first place? Would she have ever gone to a tavern in the godforsaken hamlet of Ionia Corners were it not for her all-consuming passion for the glitter rock scene? If only, if only, she could have been a more practical, less artistic, and dreamy type like their friend's daughter Mindy, who was the same age. Mindy was also 18, just born four months after Janet. But she was already engaged to her high school sweetheart. She was attending nursing school, and she was content to stay home and watch the Carol Burnett show with her fiance on Saturday nights. Yes, if only, if only Janet were more like Mindy, she'd have been off doing something safer and closer to home that night as well. On the other hand, they wondered. Maybe they were too strict with her. If only, if only they had given her a freer reign to go to more concerts, farther away from Syracuse as she often begged them. Maybe, maybe, if she had gotten this fascination with the glitter rock scene out of her system sooner, long before that night, then she wouldn't have been there. It wouldn't have happened. She'd have been over it. Then there were her friends, Sue and Cindy. If only, if only she had chosen different friends who didn't share this interest, friends who didn't feed her obsession with, with the glamour rock scene and all that it entailed. If only, if only, if only. The conversations went on and on. They were a constant part of life in our house. And when each conversation ended, nothing was different. Janet's chair at the dinner table remained empty. There was a new grave in St. Joseph's Cemetery to visit on Sundays, and the mold continued to grow in the bottom of that teacup. In the end, a solid year, at least, of if-onlys had done nothing but make the pain of an unspeakably tragic loss worse. If only, if only, if only, we have all engaged in a process like what I have just described at some point in our lives. I saw so many nods of understanding while I was talking about that. Who among us has not done this at least once over something? Time when something was so painful or life-altering that are so traumatic that we were just knocked off our center and we have trouble absorbing the shock that we've been dealt. It is often the death of a loved one, but it can be a divorce or a job loss or an injury or a fire. 
It might be a cancer diagnosis or a tornado or the election of a despot. Times when a new reality suddenly overtakes our own status quo. And when these things occur, when these things happen, we want nothing more than to turn back time. If only we could, if only our loved one was back, or if only that tornado had missed our street, or if only we had stopped 20 years ago, the smoking that the doctor told us would lead to the diagnosis we're getting today. If only mom had gone to the doctor a year sooner, or if only I had spotted the sign sooner that my child was addicted before it was too late. If only I had seen that layoff coming in time to update my skills. If only I had married the nice but boring man who proposed to me instead of falling for the charming but unreliable bad boy who ruined my life. If only I had taken the risk and moved to California for that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, the one I passed up. If only, if only at the time I had realized that opportunities like that one don't come along more than once. If only... I had noticed the dog a split second before I did. I could have swerved and a family of children wouldn't be devastated by the tragic loss. If only I had checked my voicemail sooner, I would have been at that hospital when I was needed. Who among us here this morning is immune from this uniquely human form of torture? The human mind is both a blessing and a curse. It allows us to solve so many problems, so many problems, that frankly, we've gotten into the habit of overusing it. We use it at times and in ways which taunt and torture us. The if only game is one really good example of how we do this. We can imagine for ourselves and for our loved ones an infinite number of possibilities and alternative realities. We can imagine this for ourselves, for our loved ones, and yes, for the world itself. When we use this ability, this if-only ability, to envision new outcomes for situations over which we still have control, it is a wonderful and necessary tool for change and for growth. But. When we use this tool, as so many of us often do, to rewrite chapters in our lives which are already closed forever, it leaves us sad, angry, demoralized, and depressed. And carried to an extreme, we may even end up wishing away the good things as well as the bad things. Think about this. My parents were so distraught over the loss of Janet that their if-onlys eventually led them to wish out of existence the girl that they loved and missed so much. When they got to the point that they began wishing that instead of being an artistic and independent free spirit, Janet had been a traditional practical girl like their friend Mindy. They were, in a way, if you think about it, no longer even grieving the daughter that they loved but instead they had kind of unconsciously crossed over into wishing she had been a different person altogether. If only, if only, if only. Who among us this morning can say that we have not at some point unnecessarily tortured ourselves this way? whether it be grief over things that did happen or regret over things that didn't, how often have each of us engaged in the if-only game? How many of us may have come here this morning with if-onlys in their heads or who went to sleep last night with if-onlys in their heads? What event or life circumstance have you had that may have led you down this heartbreaking, frustrating, and soul-robbing road? How many of us, as my parents did, 
have at some point gorged ourselves on if-onlys until we have wished away the good right along with the bad. If only we hadn't done that. If only we hadn't done that. Think of the hours of pain and sadness and frustration and rage we would have spared ourselves. If only we'd seen sooner what a futile exercise it really is. My mother died in 2013, and I expected to feel the same level of grief and angst that I had felt when Janet was killed and when my father and my grandparents died. They all died by the time I was 18, so I had lots of practice with the if-only game because we did it again when my father died and when my grandfather died, we did it again. In my father's case, it was mostly if only we had gone straight to the hospital when he first got that chest pain, but instead he came home and took Maalox, thinking it was his stomach. With my grandmother, it was if only we had known how desperately unhappy she was we could have intervened before she took her own life. But this was different the day my mother died. I was sad, but I wasn't tortured as I had been all of the other times. She died at noon, and by 7 o'clock that night, Michael and I were at home surrounded by friends who had brought food, and I was fine. I was sad, but I was fine. When my lack of angst over this finally came to my awareness, I was puzzled. Why? Why am I okay? Was I in denial? Did the same level of torture await me once I grasped this new loss? Or was it age? Was it the fact that I was 50 instead of 15? Did mere age confer upon me a level of composure that comes to us with time? I spent several days wondering about this. And then I realized that the difference was this. I realized what it was. I think in part because I had spent so much of my adolescence on if-onlys, I had at least to a large degree, not completely, but to a large degree, I learned not to play that game anymore. My, my mother's death was sudden. She was only sick for three weeks. And we only learned that it was a fatal illness five days before she died. So what was the difference? I realized finally that the difference between this death and the others was that as soon as the doctor told us there wasn't any hope and that my mother would actually die quite soon, I was able somehow to move past the if -onlys and get to the acceptance phase of the grieving process. This is going to happen. I did not engage in the if-onlys that we could have. If only she'd gone to the doctor sooner, if only this hadn't happened for 10 more years, all of those things that we do at those times. I don't know why I'm not claiming to have any special uh, spiritual strength or certitude, but for some reason in that moment, I was able to just accept what was happening and what was going to happen and accept the fact that I really couldn't do anything to change it. And I have truly come to believe that a big part of what makes grief so painful is our lack of willingness to accept what has happened. Our tendency to play the if-only game. And I also believe that if we can somehow, somehow manage to short-circuit that process, we can spare ourselves a great deal of pain. The third girl in the accident was my sister's friend, Cindy, her best friend. She was, as everyone said, the lucky one, the sole survivor. She was sitting in the back seat, and when the convertible top flipped open at impact, she was thrown clear of the car, and she landed in a ditch. The way she landed on her shoulder caused permanent nerve damage, and she had partial paralysis. She still, to this day, has partial paralysis in this arm. But otherwise, she was physically unharmed. I'm sorry to say, emotionally, she didn't fare so well. Cindy could not cope with the loss of her best friend or with the survivor guilt that she felt. 
For the first few years after the accident, she remained close to our family, visiting often and even occasionally babysitting for myself and my other sisters. When she did spend time with us, she too engaged in the if-only game. In addition to the if-onlys that I've mentioned already, she had an additional one. Apparently, about 30 seconds before the accident, she had asked Janet for a cigarette lighter, and she was convinced that this had distracted Sue at a crucial moment, and that was why she hadn't noticed the oncoming car. If only I had waited, if only I had asked earlier, if only I didn't smoke were among the things that she would say. But her overarching if only was the fundamental basic one. If only, if only this hadn't happened. And unlike the rest of us, even my mother eventually, Cindy has never really seemed able to move forward. My father died 18 months after Janet, so he didn't really have time to move forward. But the rest of us finally did, but Cindy never really did. I've had sporadic contact with her over these 47 years since the accident, and a large part of her is permanently frozen in December 8, 1974. The event was the emotional peak of her life, and her soul revolved around it ever since, it seemed to me. She never, I don't think, left her mother's house. I don't know that she's ever formed a romantic relationship with anyone, and I don't know how much of a career she's had. In many ways, she has remained kind of a perpetual adolescent, it seemed to me, living at home, working entry-level jobs, and continuing to follow rock bands as the spirit moved her. As time went on, it became harder and harder to relate to her because she didn't seem to progress past that accident. Like Janet's room with the moldy teacup still in the spot where Janet last set it down, Cindy began to seem a little bit frozen in time. To this day, when I encounter her, she tells jokes and stories that she and Janet had shared, and she shares them in this a bit odd way as if Janet were still here and it was still 1974. And always, always, she spends a good deal of the time we spent together playing the if-only game. She has, by her own admission, never really been able to accept or make peace with what happened on that very long ago night. And now she has lived 47 of her 63 years in the land of if-only, which is sad because I can tell you that Cindy is smart and talented and funny and kind and very creative, and she missed out on her life in some ways almost as much as Janet did. We all, each and every one of us here this morning, have been touched by tragedy. We have all missed opportunities, and we've all made at least a few big mistakes. We cannot undo any of this. If only they hadn't happened, perhaps our lives would be better or richer or more fulfilling. Maybe we would have better relationships, more success, or greater peace of mind had these things not happened. We've all, probably all of us, have likely lost someone sooner than we should have. And maybe that someone would still be here today, if only. And I'm sorry to say, we will continue to miss opportunities. We'll continue to forget to check voicemails and we'll fail to act on medical advice quickly enough sometimes. It is the nature of life that these things will happen. And it is the burden of being human that we will suffer from the knowledge that things could be different if only. Let us all, each and every one of us here this morning and in the sanctuaries of their homes, watching us online, let us all covenant together to make peace with what is. And let's do that, if only, because we have no other choice.
Our final hymn is Just As Long As I Have Breath. Disappointment pierced me through, still I kept on loving you. If they ask what I did best, tell them I said yes to Please remain standing as we extinguish our chalice flame this morning and let us read together the words that are printed on the screen. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. As we close this service this morning, I invite you to place a hand over your heart. If you are joining us online, I invite you to turn your settings to gallery view and look upon the faces of those here with you. For those of us in this room, take a moment to look around at those who are here today. Mindful of our highest aspirations, bound by common faith and purpose, and yet beginning with ourselves as we are, let us take one more step together in our unending quest for dignity, justice, and love. And to this, let us say together, Amen.
Father, be 